Hi, I'm Kevin Riley, the editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. I'd like to officially welcome you to the 2020 AJC Decatur Book Festival. If ever there was a year that shows the power of books, stories, and words, this is it. Pandemic or not, the festival goes on. And while we won't see each other around town the way we all so look forward to each year, the festival will still be one of the high points of our year. Here to tell you about what you have to look forward to is Joy Pope, the Executive Director of the AJC Decatur Book Festival. Good afternoon and welcome to the 15th anniversary Atlanta Journal-Constitution Decatur Book Festival presented by Emory University. It's been a tough year, but we've made it to September. We couldn't have gotten here without the help of a lot of people, and I wanna take a moment to thank them. Our major sponsors, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Emory University, the City of Decatur, WABE, MailChimp, the DeKalb Library System, the DeKalb Entertainment Commission, Agnes Scott College, Georgia Humanities, Atlanta Pro AV, Hella Good Marketing, Book Logics, and Whole Foods Market. Also, kicking us off tonight, Ideas United is sponsoring our keynote address. Ideas United is an Atlanta-based content studio that produces story-driven live events and conferences. Thanks for helping us out. This has been a tough year for our independent booksellers. If you can buy your festival books from one of our indies, it helps. Karis Books and More, Eagle Eye Books, Little Shop of Stories, Tall Tales, Foxtail Bookshop, and Brave and Kind Books. These bookstores have our festival books on their shelves or on order and the booksellers are ready to help. I'd like to thank the Decatur Book Festival Board of Directors for helping me weather the storm of 2020 and our staff, contractors, and volunteers. Elisa Iannilli, Steve Salcedo, Diane Capriola, Ela Wade, Ted Nelson and Roland Alonzi, Joy Uki, Chuck Tedder and James Taylor, and one more. On loan from Emory University, Caroline Corbett. Caroline is the brilliant graphic designer behind this year's festival design you'll see on our poster and t-shirts. Thank you, Caroline. Darren Wong and Tom Bell had this crazy idea back in, in 2005 that Decatur needed a book festival. Since then, every Labor Day weekend, tens of thousands of people descend on Decatur to enjoy, uh, enjoy our free author programming, to shop, eat in our restaurants, have fun. Authors come here to launch their careers. They go back to New York to their publicists and say they have so much fun here that they find our volunteers so hus hospitable, our town so cool. Decatur is not the only beneficiary of this festival act activity. People fly in on Delta and American Airlines and others. The hotels fill up, the restaurants, the bookstores. All of this has been a real problem during COVID-19. There's been an economic loss. It makes us understand one of the ways the book festival helps our community, but that's not it. We're not just an event. The Decatur Book Festival is an organization built out of relationships between sponsors, partners, community members, booksellers, and authors, whose collective engagement and enthusiasm for literature makes up the heartbeat we measure our rhythm by. Together, we believe in the transformative power of literature, of writing, reading, and ideas. We also believe in the power of sharing all of that. Yesterday afternoon, I delivered books to the Andrew P. Stewart Center in Southwest Atlanta to be delivered again to community members in the Pittsburgh neighborhood. These are books for tomorrow's Kid Note Address and Sunday's Cook Note Address. This is in partnership with Georgia Humanities. Together, we are taking the virtual festival to Southwest Atlanta. In another partnership with the DeKalb Entertainment Commission, today, 40 books were delivered to kids in DeKalb County. These are for tomorrow's kid, no kid notebooks. We believe that the power of literature belongs everywhere. Today's event embodies all of this. As you probably know, Jericho Brown recently won the 2020 Pulitzer Prize in Poetry. We're all so proud. Jericho is a brilliant man an original poet, a very original voice. It is with so much pride that he is our keynote speaker this year. 
together in conversation with Matuan Howard, our board president. Matuan Howard is Yale's Associate Vice President for Development and the former Senior Vice President for Development Programs at Emory University. He's a devotee of arts and literacy communities. He's been on our board for, since 2016. If you enjoyed today's program and the free programming that goes on throughout September, you might want to help us. We need to raise money in order to continue this programming and to bring back the physical festival. We're a nonprofit. We depend on sponsorships and donations to make all of this work. If you help us, thank you so much. There's a green donate button at the bottom of the screen. Enjoy. Thanks, Joy. All right, real excited to be here today uh, and be here with Jericho. Let me go ahead and properly introduce you, Jericho. Jericho has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at, at Harvard, and the National Endowment for Arts. And he's the winner of the Whiting Award. Brown's first book, Please, won the American Book Award. His second book, The New Testament, won the Annisville Wolf Book Award. His third collection, The Tradition, which this year won the Pulitzer Prize, as we all know. His poems have appeared in the Bennington Review, BuzzFeed, Fence, Jubilat, The New Republic, The New York Times, The New Yorker, The Paris Review, and many, many more. He is an associate professor and director of the creative writing program at Emory University. Good afternoon. Hi. How are you? <laughs> How are you? I'm good. I, I, I still can't believe that I, you know, I've not been able to see you in person for yeah, months. I can't believe it either. But it's nice to be here. You know, it gave me an excuse to put some hair dye on, so it's cool. Well, I tell you, you know, the same thing here. It's the first time I've uh, worn a jacket in I don't know how long. And actually, I, I, even, I even put on shoes for you. Oh, wow. So. <laughs> yeah, that's real deep meaning. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, we're all in this really curious moment. Um, you know, when you think about everything that's been going on, uh, you know, especially since February, March, I'm just curious. I figure let's, let's start there. You know, how have you personally navigated, you know, this time of social distancing and isolation, especially from the creative sense? You know, do you feel the time and focus has actually aided your creative process or hindered it? Well, it's a really interesting question because I feel like I'm in a position where I wouldn't know the answer. Uh, it is very much like me to write a book. The Tradition was my third book and what I've noticed uh, what I noticed with those first two books uh, is that, and what I'm noticing with this one is that it takes a while for the, the well to fill back up. Um, so I'm sort of waiting for the muses to speak to me again. And I think I would have been, whether it were the pandemic or not. Uh, but then again, I should say, I always feel like I'm not writing. Uh, and being in a relationship very soon taught me that I'm always writing. You know, when you're with somebody, they'll say, we're gonna be late to the movies again because you're writing. Uh, so often uh, what I'm doing that, that I don't think of as writing is writing. Uh, most of my work, most of my work happens over a period of time and I look up and I see, oh, I have poems. And I sort of don't realize that I've accumulated the number of poems I've accumulated um, as I'm writing them. So I haven't been to my mind very productive uh, since the pandemic began. But I also understand that I'm a poet by identity, which is to say that everything I'm reading, all the art that I'm observing during this time, all of the news I see uh, through social media and on television, all of that, every conversation I have with my family, I'm talking to my family more than, uh, more than I ever imagined as a kid, I would be talking to them as an adult. And all of that, is indeed uh, going to where I will need it when it's time to make a poem. And I have to believe that. Yeah, oh, makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I, you were somewhat busy. I was, I was really struck by 
the poem you wrote during the pandemic or in response to it, so to speak. Uh, say thank you, say I'm sorry. I was wondering if you might want to share that uh, with everyone right now. Yeah, I'll read it. Say thank you, say I'm sorry. I don't know whose side you're on, but I am here for the people who work in grocery stores that glow in the morning and close down for deep cleaning at night, right up the street and in cities I mispronounce, in towns too tiny for my big black car to quit, and in every wide corner of Kansas where going to school means at least one field trip to a slaughterhouse. I want so little another leather-bound book, a gimlet with a lavender gin, bread so good when I taste it, I can tell you how it's made. I'd like us to rethink what it is to be a nation. I'm in a mood about America today. I have PTSD about the Lord. God, save the people who work in grocery stores. They know a bit of glamour is a lot of glamour. They know how much it costs for the eldest of us to eat. Save my loves and not my sentences. Before I see them, I draw a mole near my left dimple, add flair to the smile they can't see behind my mask. I grin or lie, or maybe I wear the mouth of a beast. I eat wild animals while some of us grow up knowing what gnocchi is. The people who work at the grocery store don't care. They say, thank you. They say, sorry, we don't sell motor oil anymore. With a grief so thick, you could touch it. Go on, touch it. It is early, it is late. They have washed their hands. They have washed their hands for you and they take the bus home. Thank you. Thank you. What, what do you think most people are missing about this moment? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what most people, I mean, the funny thing about the moment is that it, it, it doesn't put you in contact with most people, so you don't know, right? Uh, <laughs> I do think, I do think there's a moment, I hate to say this because I sound like some sort of a zealot or something, but uh, the opening of the seventh seal in Revelation, I was talking to my friend Ayanna Mathis, the writer about this, and how at the opening of the seventh seal uh, in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, there's silence for 30 minutes. And I think maybe we missed our opportunity for silence, uh, if we're missing anything. Uh, for me, it was really important, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, that I use this as an opportunity to do what I felt. I had fallen behind on while I was on book tour. And what I had fallen behind on, to be quite honest with you, was affirmative prayer and meditation, looking inward, uh, thinking about my mind and what my thoughts really were. What do, I, what do I see when I look at the world and what do I see when I look at myself? Uh, and I really, I really think this was an opportunity for many of us to do that and we didn't because we were so busy trying to figure out how to go back to work, how to start things, how to keep things going, uh, when obviously the planet had told us to slow down, had told us to stop. Um, so I'm sort of interested in, you know, what it means for us to look at something that says, I mean, everything about it says, slow down, stop. I mean, what do you do when you slow down and stop? You immediately, I'm a poet, so maybe this is easier for me to, easy for me to think this way, but you immediately think, you reflect, you meditate. Uh, and so I've, I've really tried to use the time to become uh, closer to the, the higher self um, than what I was before, which is always my aim and part of what I want through my poems. That poem that I just read, probably would not have gotten written. I'm not one for an occasional poem, but I was asked by the New York Times to write a poem. And so I did, and I had some lines sitting around that I'd already been working on. So it worked out uh, that I had that. But I haven't, uh, although I sort of, I would love to be writing uh, in a real, I'm writing every day, but I would love to see poems at the end of some of that. I'm not seeing that, but I'm also, you know, you just have to be patient when it comes to art. Just like we're patient 
as it relates to everything else. You know, anything you do well, you did not do well the first time you tried to do it. So. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, I've had the, the great honor of sitting in your class with uh, eight students riffing over page breaks and structure. Yeah. I've also watched you uh, watch one of your students recite original poetry from the stage at the Decatur Book Festival. And you were looking like a proud pop. When does the poet become the professor or the professor become the poet? Or are they one and the same? Well, for me, they're one and the same. I mean, the poet is what's first in my life. And I decided a long time ago that it would be what was first in my life. Um, and I, dis I disciplined my, my life around that identity. And I think it's a good idea that if you want to do something, you should discipline your life around that identity and become that thing by identity. Uh, and because that's first, I understand that I would not be, I would not be a professor if I weren't a poet. I'm only a professor because I'm a poet. Um, being a professor allows me to continue to read more poetry that I otherwise would probably be lazy about reading. It gives me the opportunity to interact with new poets and people who are seeking uh, ways to learn how to better make their poems sing off the page. Uh, and so I love poetry so much that I became a professor in order to be even closer to poetry, you know, is the way I see it. Um, and when I, when I talk to my students about their writing, I, that's how I describe what they're doing. I tell them, well, this is what's going on in your work. Or, you know, as a poet, you have to, you know, you have to begin to call your students, I have to begin to call my students poets so that they can begin to see themselves that way. Uh, and that's, so I don't know that there's a beginning or an end. I, I think, you know, the moment at which I'm grading papers, I don't feel like very much of a poet. <laughs> but but I am a poet all the time, you know. Yeah. Wow. No, that, that's I love awesome. I love teaching. It's very difficult to teach right now. Um, part of what I loved about teaching was seeing the light bulbs go off in per, in in person. You know, when you're talking to young people, and there's an energy in that room. Uh, anybody who's had a classroom, a good classroom experience, whether as a teacher or a student knows this, there's an energy in that room. You can't touch it, but it's there. And there's something going back and forth between every, among everyone uh, in that room. And, uh, I, you know, I miss that. Uh, and I feel like, I don't know if it's Emory students. I, I'm really proud of Emory students in this moment, though. Um, my students are showing up to this class on Zoom, you know, my students at Zoom University. They're showing up to this class every time we meet. And if I feel at all exhausted by Zoom, <laughs> they enliven me all over again because they're, they are hungry for whatever it is that I have to give them. And I see it in their faces. Um, I just wish that I could, you know, hand them a piece of paper with a poem on it. Do you know what I mean? Or write <laughs> on the board. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's a little difficult for me because I don't have the same resources that I had before, and it's harder to check. There's a way that you can check in with your students individually in the class without saying a word. You sort of see. Yeah. Harder to see what each student is going through when you present a new idea when they're on a screen. You know, it's particularly hard when you're sharing a screen and you can't see that you're looking at the screen, but you can't see the students anymore. So they're, they're, it's very uh, different, but they meet me. You know, my students have met me um, at any point that I might falter and, and they've been so encouraging. Sometimes I show up and I'm like, I don't know how we're gonna do this. Uh, for instance, I'll give you an example. Every, in all of my classes, students are required to recite at least seven lines of a poem, uh, which they're all nervous. Of. I mean, it's seven lines and they're all nervous. And I always tell them, you can recite all of Beowulf if you want, you know, we'll cancel, <laughs> we will not, we'll let you sit there and do that and we'll cancel the rest of class. And they, um, I said, well, maybe I have to take this off of the syllabus because I have no way of knowing if you actually recited it or just read it off your screen or like put it behind your computer or something. And one of my students, and at that very moment, one of my students said, we could just blindfold ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> so now they're doing, they were all excited to blindfold themselves in order to do the invocation, in order to do this recitation of a poem. Like this was their idea. And so now that they're doing these recitations, they show up and they put, their masks, you know, how we're all wearing masks, and they put their masks over their eyes and recite their poems. And it's so, I, mean, I don't know, it's just, wow. 
it's be- I think it's beautiful. And um, one of the ways that shows, you know, they're the survivors. These students, they're the heroes of this moment for yeah. us. Well, that makes me think about a, a question I wanted to ask you. I feel like I've heard you talk about this. Uh, you know, what, what are some of the greatest lessons that you have received from your students through teaching? Well, one is that I just have to continue to be aware and it gets more and more difficult because there are so many poets. You know, there was a time, and I mean this honestly, there was a time that I could read. When I was in graduate school, I, in a calendar year, would read every book of poetry by a black poet. Literally every one of them, because that was the number of them that came out every year. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. And now it's much harder to keep up uh, with poetry. Uh, I feel like I'm still a poetry scholar, but contemporary poetry has grown far and wide in ways that I never imagined when I first started teaching. But I, I, have, I feel it is my responsibility to be aware of what's going on in contemporary poetry because that's what I need to lead my two students to. My students need to be influenced by what I might not be influenced by. Um, and so what I've really learned from them is to stay capacious, to stay open, uh, and to always be looking around in a way for what poets are being read in this moment. And often I find, uh, you know, poets like Taylor Johnson, who I think is amazing, I find because of that, I find poets that I otherwise would not have found who are supposedly um, outside of my aesthetic, but whose work influenced me and therefore is incorporated in my aesthetic. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. As you were talking, I was, I was thinking about, a, a, I believe, a conversation I, I was, uh, as I was preparing for this, uh, heard you uh, talking about line breaks. Yeah. And I, I, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about that because as I'm thinking about this moment and all the things you were just talking about, I mean, I truly feel that everyone is literally living one big line break right yeah. now. You know what I mean? It's just like, I mean, that's, that, it just came to me that we're living a line break. And, and, and I, I just love to hear, hear you kind of break it down. Well, we might be living a whole stanza break, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things, uh, line breaks are, um, one of the one of the reasons I fell in love with poetry as a kid is because it's written in lines and because of line breaks. And I was wowed by what would happen to me as a reader when I would get to, you know, I was nine, eight, nine years old, and I would get to the end of a line and say, what do I do now? And invariably, I put my eyes at the beginning of the next line, you know, <laughs> I'm like, what is that for? What is that about? And it's always seemed to me that that's about faith and doubt. You know, that in the line, we're in a moment of faith, particularly in early poems. I mean, very much a moment of faith because because they're blank verse. They're iambic pentameter. They all have a meter that we become accustomed to. Uh, but then when we get to the line, to the end of the line, though we might be enthralled by that music, we don't know what's going to happen next in terms of the subject or the content or the story of the poem. And so in that moment, we have to like hold on. And you're only holding on for a middle millisecond, right? But you have to hold on for that millisecond in order to get to that next line. And what should be uh, on that next line is a surprise. I remember uh, in whatever workspace I was using when I was working on my first book, I had written over that workspace every line a surprise. And that's always been one of the things that I've tried to do as a poet every time I write a line, as I write the next line, I want to say something I myself did not expect to say. And if I can do that, then I can be rest assured that the reader will have that experience of coming to the next line and being like, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> like, I don't know where this is going, which is what I like uh, about art, period. Uh, what I like about uh, many of the artists that I love the most and, and uh, many of the films I love the most. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. I, I truly feel that right now we're 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 really in this. Everybody is like you said, holding on. We are sit, literally holding on right now and just yeah. Yeah. you know trying to figure out what's next. Yeah, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, this year has has really been overwhelming uh, with regard to loss. You know, and and now we're at you know 180 thousand dead from COVID. Uh, you know, I'll never forget talking with you after losing our friend Pelham. Yeah. 
you know, and then this weekend we lost Chadwick Bozeman. Mm -hmm. How do you approach loss in the creative sense? And which of your poems do you turn to during times of loss? Yeah, you know, I said, um, I'll read a poem that has to do with loss uh, to answer this question, but um, it's really interesting, you know, the, the, the poets, the po one of the poets who's been really most important to me is Natasha Trethewey, uh, hmm. as it relates to the elegy, uh, also the elegiac mode. Um, I mean, her work is really, we have a lot in common as people. And so when I read her poems, I'm like, that's my family. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, um, and she, uh, she, there's something she does in the grieving that happens in the grieving in her poems that always makes the grieving process turn whole because she is in that moment enacting a kind of memory and therefore bringing the person back that she's grieving. And you know, Kevin Young, our colleague, uh, has an entire anthology about grief. Um, I have a poem actually that came out in my last book uh, called Turn You Over, which is mm -hmm. uh, one of the ways that I try to deal with the idea of loss and of grief. Um, turn you over. All my anxiety is separation anxiety. I want to believe you are here with me, but the bed is bigger and the trash overflows. Someone righteous should take out my garbage. I am so many odd and enviable things. Righteous is not one of them. I'd rather a man to avoid than a man to imagine in a realm unseen Though even the doctor who shut your eyes swears you're somewhere as close as breath, mine, not yours. You don't have breath. You got heaven. That's mm -hmm. supposed to be my haven. I want you to tell me it sparkles there. I want you to tell me anything again and again while I turn you over to quiet you or to wake and remind you I can't be expected to clean up after a man. So there's, mm. there's that poem. Yeah. Wow. I think wow. It's about, about loss, which, which the poets, you know, the poets keep coming back to love and death, love and death. Um, and I do believe that poetry, reading it and writing it, uh, reading poetry for me has been a, a tremendous way of dealing with loss and dealing <clears throat> with grief uh, and getting over certain moments in my life so I believe in the power of poetry to do that absolutely absolutely I mean when you really look at this year it's it's you know there's been so much grieving and, and all the tumultuous events that are that are going on and you know truly it's it's been a hell of a year to be a black person yeah I mean you have certainly addressed the topic of race throughout your various books and essays and what have you where are we right now <laughs> I mean, do you have hope? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I can't help but think about bullet points and, and, and the tradition. I mean, do you ever get tired that the narrative is just not changing? I mean, why, why do we normalize or how have we normalized violence? I mean, I, I, when I think about in particular bullet points, um, you know, that was written about Sandra. <laughs> and and here we are in 2020. Mm -hmm. It's as relevant as if, you know, mm -hmm. yesterday. I mean, so it's just, I'd love you to speak to that. And I don't know if you'd want to read a couple of those or, or whatever I can read, you think is appropriate. I can, read, I can read bullet points. I'll, um, maybe I should read the poem before I speak to that. Cause I don't, you're asking me, <laughs> I mean, this is a very difficult question. Talking yeah. about race in America, man, you'd be talking forever. <laughs> as we can see, right? Uh, I mean, it's absolutely boring. <laughs> like, like what? You know what I mean? You know, as a person who, I mean, you know, you know, I'm an Aries, uh, so I'm a bit of a thrill seeker. So, <laughs> but, you know, this conversation about race is like, and the worst part about it is, even if you're writing well about it, you're not saying anything that wasn't said by '65. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like 1865 yeah. to 196, that was the hundred years to get it all out. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, 
uh, Anna Julia Cooper, and then um, and then W. E. B. Du Bois talking about the the problem of the 20th century is the color line. Well, I guess that's just the problem of all the centuries. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it's very difficult, um, which is which is part of why I'm a poet. Um, you know, poems allow me the opportunity to fix uh, these ideas and these emotions that seem unfixable, that seem chaotic. And so I can get them down in an order. And at least for that moment that I'm reading and writing the poem, in that moment, that chaos in the world feels a little more like an order that I, under, that I better understand. Poems also make laws. Um, and I think there are some laws, and I'll read this poem and you'll hear uh, what I mean. Poems say prayers, poems make laws. Bullet points. I will not shoot myself in the head. And I will not shoot myself in the back. And I will not hang myself with a trash bag. And if I do, I promise you, I will not do it in a police car while handcuffed or in the jail cell of a town I only know the name of because I have to drive through it to get home. Yes, I may be at risk, but I promise you, I trust the maggots who live beneath the floorboards of my house to do what they must to any carcass more than I trust an officer of the law of the land to shut my eyes like a man of God might or to cover me with a sheet so clean my mother could have used it to tuck me in. When I kill me, I will do it the same way most Americans do. I promise you, cigarette smoke or a piece of meat on which I choke, or so broke I freeze in one of these winters we keep calling worst. I promise if you hear of me dead anywhere near a cop, then that cop killed me. He took me from us and left my body, which is, no matter what we've been taught, greater than the settlement a city can pay a mother to stop crying, and more beautiful than the new bullet fished from the folds of my brain. Wow. So one of the, um, one of the um, best compliments and also sort of, though it's very true, um, one of the best compliments and, and maybe in some ways most damning things that was ever said to me about this poem, it was really a beautiful, I mean, it means the world to me that he said this. It's the, the hugest compliment coming from him. A Tayyem Bajest, the poem, I love Tayyem's poem. Uh, I think he's, uh, he's just a genius. And Tayemba said, uh, you know, that's a poem that every black person needs to walk around with in their wallet. <laughs> wow. Which that's turns deep. out to be sort of thematically, I mean, you know, whether or not I mm. that, I'll leave up to the Pulitzer Committee. But, you know, which, you know, turns out to mm. be thematically true, which yeah. is also the worst thing about the poem. You know, one of the ways that I know mm. um, that another person has been unnecessarily, another black person has been unnecessarily murdered by the police, is suddenly when I check my email and my social media, that poem is being posted over mm. and over again. And um, so it's a hard thing to live with, Matuan, to, uh, to write something that stands for a moment or stands for a time, or maybe not the moment, stands for a black feeling, right? A black knowledge. Um, and yet to also wish that knowledge didn't have to exist, you know? Um, there's a lot of knowledge among, you know, I believe that what unites us, uh, what we have in common, what we know of each other is not all this ugly, traumatic stuff, right? Um, I, I would like to believe uh, that there would still be something about our collard greens. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? That like culturally, we have things in common. Yeah. Uh, but, and that is not, and what we, what we have in common does not only have to be our oppression. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, obviously without that impression, that oppression, uh, we don't know because, you know, it's always been there. It's at the back of, of so much of our journey of so much of our lives here on this planet Earth and in this nation. Uh, but I would like to believe that there is something pure in Al Green, you know, in love and happiness, you know, that there's something <laughs> pure 
in um, Frankie Beverly and, and Mays, you know, the golden time of day. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? I would love Absolutely. to. I want to know that, you know, and it's hard to know that when everything we have in common, you know, is so emergency oriented because it, there, it really is a matter of life and death. Um, and so that hurts, you know, because you don't know, you know, you're always writing your poems because you got, I got to write my life. And yet my life, you know, my memory, my, a real memory of my life is being thrown across the trunk of my own car for no reason by police. That's a real memory of my life. And my job as a poet is to deal with my memories. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, uh, so that's what I mean when I say it's very difficult. It's very difficult to discuss, particularly if you're any kind of a spiritual being and you want to be an affirming person. Do you know, it gets really hard. Um, so I don't know. I don't know that I have answers about, I should. It's the Decatur Book Festival. It's my favorite holiday. I, <laughs> answer, I should be saying, you know what I mean? Like, this is my festival. Yeah. It really is. I really feel like, you know, so somebody gave it to me as a gift. I unwrapped it as mine. Um, <laughs> so I want to say hopeful things, but it's very hard to see hopeful things in this moment for us as a community, which is why we need to begin to see hopeful things for us individually. Um, I mean, the real question is, I mean, for me at least, is what can I do? What is my, what is my, what gift can I, can Jericho Brown give? Uh, and that's what I want to believe. I want to believe that if you make furniture, you can make, fur you can make your furniture making have something to do with this moment. If you cook, you can make your cooking have something to do with this moment. Um, that there is indeed a way to make, uh, you know, this is what Martin Luther King said about being the best street, uh, street sweeper you can be, right? You know, right. there is that I want to believe that there is a way to achieve uh, social, justi social justice and, 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 and racial justice um, through, through uh, street sweeping. Do you know what I mean? That, uh, that, absolutely. And, and it's our job to improvise, to innovate and figure out how. That that's yeah. part of you know, what we need to be doing in this moment. And we have to do that on the level of one. Because um, trying to do it as a group is not, ooh, yeah. no, <laughs> let, let, let's, let's camp out there for a second. I mean, you, let's talk about you. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you, you invented a new form. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I, I think, I mean, you did something about this moment. So why don't you talk about duplex and, and how it led to tradition? Yeah, well, I invented the duplex because um, uh, I invented the duplex because I wanted a form that was sort of a vessel the way I see myself as a vessel or, or the way I imagine people see me. Um, you know, I'm a lot of things at one time and that gets on a lot of folks' nerves. You know, the more people find out about me, the more they're like, huh? You know, like I like to play spades and I like to read books. I'm a little bit of a frat boy who goes to the gym a lot. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? And I also want to, you know, I also want to twerk on the dance floor. Do you, <laughs> Do you follow what I mean? Like there's a lot going, you know, I, you know I've, been in, I've been around people where, um, you know, in social situations, I was with a group of friends one time, I'll never forget this. And um, one of my friends said, oh, okay, Dr. Brown. And um, another friend said, why, why are you calling him Dr. Brown? And he was like, oh, he has a PhD. He said, no, he doesn't. <laughs> like that wasn't a possibility for my life, you know? Right. Um, you know, and so I wanted all of who I am to be, ref I want all of who I am to be possible in a single body. And that's what I wanted from the duplex. I was like, how many forms can I get in one form? And so I mean for the duplex to be a sonnet, a huzzle, and a blues poem, all mm. of those. And, um, I'll, re I'll read one for you. And I think you can hear, um, I think you can hear those, those things come out. Duplex. I begin with love, hoping to end there. I don't want to leave a messy corpse. I don't want to leave a messy corpse full of medicines that turn in the sun. Some of my medicines turn in the sun. Some of us don't need hell to be good. Those who need most need hell to be good. 
what are the symptoms of your sickness? Here is one symptom of my sickness. Men who love me are men who miss me. Men who leave me are men who miss me in the dream where I am an island. In the dream where I am an island, I grow green with hope. I'd like to end there. So that's sort of how the, the poem works. Yeah, wow, that's awesome. All right, I've, I've buried the lead long enough. Can I read, let's, can I read let, let's talk about the Pulitzer. Let me read, can I read you one more? Can I read oh, you, oh, you want to read another duplex? Great. I have another duplex at the end of this book. Um, and I wanted to read it just because we were talking about duplexes and talking about form. And I know yeah. people were frustrated. I started talking about form and I seemed like such a nerd. I'm such a poetry nerd, uh, <laughs> which I'm really proud of, but which drives people up, up a wall. My students are like, wait, he's still talking about the sonnet right now? Like, they're like, wait, is that the same thing? He's still talking about it? Um, so uh, this next poem, I'll just read it because it's a duplex, but it's also a cento. And it takes, which means it, it takes its lines from other sources, but it's made up, this poem is made up of all the other lines from the other duplexes in the book. Duplex, cento. My last love drove a burgundy car, color of a rash, a symptom of sickness. We were the symptoms, the road our sickness. None of our fights ended where they began. None of the beaten end where they begin. Any man in love can cause a messy corpse. But I didn't want to leave a messy corpse, obliterated in some lily field. Stench obliterating lilies of the field, the murderer young and unreasonable. He was so young, so unreasonable, steadfast and awful, tall as my father, steadfast and awful, my tall father was my first love. He drove a burgundy car. Yeah, so huh. That's the duplex moment. Yeah. <clears throat> that's I'm amazing. Glad I did that. I can't believe I did it, but I'm glad. I, did <laughs> I think the world is glad you did that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I brought up the Pulitzer. I, I'm just curious. Do you feel you were able to truly experience the honor? I mean, I imagine for the most part, you were stuck at home like, like, most people are doing a bunch of Zoom calls and phone calls. Um, do you think receiving the recognition in the midst of the crisis moment takes on some greater meaning? I, I, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, I do. I don't know what the greater meaning is, but I do. I mean, obviously, you know, when the New York Times asked me to write their poem, they asked me because I had I won a Pulitzer. They wouldn't ask me if I had, you know what I mean? <laughs> So at least there is, at least there is one thing that we know me winning the Pulitzer was able to make uh, for me. And that's another opportunity to write a poem. And hopefully that poem does something for someone else. Um, and I have real, I mean that, like I, uh, it's not really popular even among poets right now, but I, um, I have real value in the power of a poem. I really think poems in and of themselves are a big deal um, and that each one of them matters and that they go out and do really amazing things that the poets who write them never know that they do. And I have to believe that because uh, uh, I know that that's happened for me. I know I've read poems that have changed my life. So I have to imagine that for every poem I read, uh, a life could change. And for every, every poem I write, that's my responsibility to try to like be writing, you know, some life changing stuff. Um, and so that's why when I write my poems, I want them to change my life because uh, then I believe that'll happen for the reader. So no, I don't think, um, yeah, of course I'm upset that I didn't get to party for my Pulitzer Prize. I'm really upset, Matuan, because you know, you would have been with me. Exactly. You have been wondering <laughs> why you were still out at two o'clock in the morning at the <laughs> strip club. You've been like, what am I, why oh, Jericho Lord. got me out in these streets? That's what you would have been going through. And so many other people, so many other people would have been like, why am I at Jer Jericho's house and all of his doors are open with the music blasting at four in the morning? Um, so I think maybe, uh, sometimes I wonder if I had some sort of cosmic uh, role in the creation of COVID. Because <laughs> 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 many of us would have been arrested. Just, just to keep you locked down. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, I'm a, I don't like that. I feel bad. I really feel bad for the people who win the Pulitzer after me because when it's time for us to be out in the world and in person again, I'm going to celebrate my Pulitzer like I just got it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm going to celebrate my Pulitzer like I got it yesterday. And I'm going to be reminding people that I got it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah, no, I don't, I don't like that. But I also believe things happen for a reason and that if this is the moment in which I got the Pulitzer, that was for a reason. Yeah. Uh, and that, I'm, that whatever I'm doing in this moment is exactly what I should be doing. Uh, yeah. And I, you know, it's not like we have a choice but to believe that we are where we ought to be. Absolutely. No, I agree. Well, I'll be there when, when, you, uh, when you do get that party started. I, I wanted to shift to something I found interesting. As I, every book of yours that comes out, I feel like, and maybe, you know, you tell me if I'm wrong about this, but the cover art, I feel like you, you spend more time and you connect it. Um, I don't know. I just, you know, whether it's Please or the New Testament, I mean, there's a story. I feel like it's the first line of poetry is your cover art. Man, I've been so cover lucky. <laughs> I'm really blessed. I'm serious. The first cover was done by New Issues Press, and I didn't have anything. I mean, I did have things to do with it, which ultimately the image in and of itself was the image that they decided was best for the book, and so that was going to be the image, and that and it worked out just fine, um, given the content and the themes in the book. Uh, and I, I really actually I like the cover a lot. When the, when the book first came out. Uh, I was all worried. I would never forget I was all worried because it had a mouth on the cover. And the other book that had come out before this with a mouth on the cover was Richard Sykin's Crush, which was a very popular book at the time. And I was like, oh, no, there's already a book with a mouth on the cover. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is a different mouth and it got to stand on its own. And I'm really proud of that cover. And then this cover, um, the poet Lamar Wilson, who's always, who was always sending me um, pieces of art, you know, online because he knows I love visual art. He sent me Leon Bennett's um, uh, mm -hmm. The Barber of Suez. And, he, you know, he was just sending it to me to send it to me because he's always sending me stuff. And I opened it and I was like, oh my God, it's my book cover. You know, like I was <laughs> like, how is this? What is, and I, I called him on the phone like, how, what is this? And he was like, a painting? Do you know what I mean? I'm freaking <laughs> out. So um, Copper Canyon uh, went after it and they got it. Uh, this, this book cover is actually a little bit longer of a story than that because Copper Canyon Press, my press, had already, um, had already started putting covers together. And so I literally had to get them to stop, which was very difficult. And I called my editor and I was like, I need you to see this image. I really want it for my book cover. And he said, Jericho, I don't think there's anything we can do at this point. It is very doubtful that we'll be able to change a cover. And I said, I know, I understand that. I'm good with that. I just need you to see the image. He's like, I'll look at the image, Jericho, but we're not changing your cover. I said, okay, can you, I'm sending it to you in an email now. Can you look at the image? He said, okay, I'll call you back. So I go about my life. I go about my day. Later that day, I get a call and he says, so yeah, of course we have to use this as the image. <laughs> And then this, isn't that nice? Oh, it's beautiful. I, mean, special? I think that's the best book cover ever. This is an image by L. Ralph, Ralphie Bur Burgess. And y'all see, I've been, this is my reading copy of this book. It's really frayed and, and all beat up. But um, I really love this. It's called You're in the Middle of the World. I love that. And I, um, I fell in love with this. Obviously, it looks just like the poem, the tradition in many ways. Um, but I found, I found this because I literally Googled, because you know, ultimately, I think of the tradition as a pastoral book, a book about the environment. You know, I got, I got all the trees you can name, all the flowers, I got rabbits, like what else, do you, do you know what I mean? Um, and I, I, that's what I really, when I first started writing these poems, I was really setting out to write about the natural world and other things started seeping in. And uh, I remember I Googled black men with flowers or black boys with flowers and I hit images and I scrolled to the bottom of the page and it was there and I was like that's it and um, so we worked with her and we made a cover of the book so I, I have been you're right 
Very, let me knock on. <laughs> very lucky with covers because it seems like they're all made just for the book, but in two cases they, you know, they were floating out in the world. So. Wow. Well, they're perfect. Well, <clears throat> as we get ready to close things out, I know we're going to have some time to answer some questions from all the people who are watching online in the chat and what have you. But before we do that, I was wondering if you might read a selection from the tradition and maybe close us out with the prayer of the backhanded. But you, t you, you, know, you can do what you want with us. That, that's just my, my thoughts. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll read, um, well, I'll read the tradition. How about I read four day in the morning? I'll read four day in the morning and I'll read the tradition. All right. Um, and then I'll read prayer of the backhanded. Is that good? That's good. Four day in the morning. My mother grew morning glories that spilled onto the walkway toward her porch because she was a woman with land who showed as much by giving it color. She told me I could have whatever I worked for. That means she was an American. But she'd say it was because she believed in God. I am ashamed of America and confounded by God. I thank God for my citizenship in spite of the timer set on my life to write these words. I love my mother. I love black women who plant flowers as sheepish as their sons. By the time the blooms unfurl themselves for a few hours of light, the women who tend them are already at work. Blue, I'll never know who started the lie that we are lazy but I'd love to wake that bastard up at 4 a.m. in the morning, toss him in a truck, and drive him under God past every bus stop in America to see all those black folk waiting to go work for whatever they want. A house, a boy to keep the lawn cut, some color in the yard. My God, we leave things green. Hmm. Here's a tradition. The tradition. Aster, nasturtium, delphinium. We thought fingers in dirt meant it was our dirt. Learning names in heat in elements classical philosophers said could change us. Stargazer, foxglove. Summer seemed to bloom against the will of the sun, which news reports claimed flamed hotter on this planet than when our dead fathers wiped sweat from their necks. Cosmos, baby's breath. Men like me and my brothers filmed what we planted for proof we existed before too late. Sped the video to see blossoms brought in seconds, colors you expect in poems where the world ends. Everything cut down. John Crawford, Eric Garner, Mike Brown. Hmm. I'll read on. I'll read Prayer of the Bank Handed. I know you like that poem. It's fun. I used to know this poem by heart. Maybe I can recite it. It's in the first book. Let's see. Prayer of the Back Handed. Not the palm, not the pear tree switch, not the broomstick, nor the closest extension cord, not his braided belt, but God. Bless the back of my daddy's hand, which holding nothing tightly against me and not wrapped in leather, eliminated the air between itself and my cheek. Make full this dimpled cheek, unworthy of its unfisted print, and forgive my forgetting the love of a hand hungry for reflex, a hand that took no thought of its target, like hail from a blind sky, involuntary, fast, but brutal in its bruising. Father, I bear the bridge of what might have been a broken nose. I lift to you what was a busted lip. Bless the boy who believes his best beatings lack intention, the mark of the beast. Bring back to life the son who glories in the sin of immediacy calling it love. God, save the man whose arm, like an angel's invisible wing, may fly backward 
in fury. Help me hold in place my blazing jaw as I think to say, excuse me. Hmm. Yeah, I think I got it right. I think you got it right. Thank you Stun, so much. Stunned silence is sometimes the, the best uh, response. Obviously, if we were sitting in the Schwartz Center right now, there would be a standing ovation going on. And standing that's, ovation, <laughs> but the ovation is happening online. People are are, are, are certainly letting them know how amazing it was. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts as well as your work with us today. We really, Thank truly you. appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Vaughn. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jericho. All right, Jericho, I gotta tell you, the, the chat is blowing up. We got over a thousand people online <laughs> and uh, they're, they're, they're just raving about you. Uh, no surprise there. Um, so I, I'm actually, I've, I've started to get a few questions uh, from people that have uh, been enjoying the program so far. So if you're okay, I'd love to ask you a few questions from a lot of people online. Please do, thanks. Here's a, a really, really good question. It's interesting. Uh, the question is, when you write about your personal history, how do you manage to not allow emotion to pull you under in your effort to make it more than a meditation, but something artistic as well? Uh, I, was, I would say that I depend on a few things. One is that I depend and believe in time. You know, we have all these doubts and we feel bad about time. What I believe about poetry is that when I write something, uh, even just a line, which I I'm, I'm want to write, I'll write a line and I'll leave it alone. I don't care. I don't stress out about the fact that there's nothing under that line. You know, um, I imagine that I will live the experiences necessary to meet that line with other lines later in time. Um, the oldest line in this last book is from 1999. So I'm keeping everything. And when I, revise, I'm not just looking at where I started or what I knew when I sat down to write the poem. I'm looking at what I discovered through the investigation of writing the poem. So there are always things that come up in a, in a poem that you did not expect to say. That's how you know you're writing. You know you're writing because you say what you do not expect to say. And saying what you do not expect to say leads you to where that personal or so, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the, um, in the word personal these days. Uh, but it leads you to where that person, that so-called personal experience reaches out to other kinds of experience. And that reach is where I know to make revising happen. That's where um, I know, oh, this is going beyond the self and therefore I wanna keep it. But this is only the self in a way that does not make a reach beyond. And so maybe it doesn't have to stay in the poem. Okay, that's great, thank you. I, I've been looking at the chat. We have, we have people from Kansas to Portugal, and uh, but I got a real local question here, and they're they're curious about if you've ever worked with a Georgia Tech po poetry program. Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, Georgia Tech, Emory University, uh, Berry College in Rome, and um, and Westminster uh, School here in Atlanta are teaming up for a translation summit. Uh, last summer, we went to Germany and we worked with German poets there and we translated their poems and they translated our poems. And <laughs> this fall, uh, last, I think around the last week of October, I should look up the, the exact date. Um, we're having a few events via Zoom, you know, virtual events, uh, remote events um, that will be hosted by each campus. Uh, so uh, Emory's event is I'm really excited about because uh, Linda Gregerson and uh, Linda Gregerson and Brenda Shaughnessy will read for us and their German counterparts from that nation will will translate their work and that's on the 28th. Um, Georgia Tech is having a big event I think on the 29th. So there's events all that weekend. You'll be able to look those up soon. Here's another question. Uh, what, what books have you turned to recently to find some hope or optimism? Uh, I would say the book that I'm most excited about 
this year uh, has been Natasha Trethway's memoir, uh, Memorial Drive. Um, I read it and then I, I couldn't get enough of it. So I bought it on audio so I could listen to it when I'm in the car, you know? <laughs> um, so it's become a part of my, you know, it's just become a part of my, my arsenal for getting over things. And that's not, let me be clear about the way literature can work. Uh, it's not because it's such a happy book. Um, it's because of the fact that it's a memoir written by Natasha Trethway. And so knowing um, that Natasha Trethway became who she is, who she is to me personally, um, out of very dire experiences in her own life, uh, actually makes me feel like I should take on a certain kind of responsibility for my own life um, and a certain kind of responsibility for my own joy and my own celebration of life. So that's been really inspiring to me and it's really just, it's a gorgeously, I mean, it's a, it's a, um, it's a harrowing story, but it's just gorgeously written. And I'm very proud that that book exists. And I hope, you know, I, uh, Natasha's reading here at the festival, um, here at the festival in your living room. <laughs> so I hope people go and I hope people buy that, buy that book. Um, you know, I think the Decatur Book Festival is really a wonderful way to get books off the ground. I read my first book at the Decatur Book Festival and I still credit it with what happened to the rest of my career because I had this opportunity to get my book off the ground. There were so many people buying books then, so. Absolutely. No, it's funny, uh, you, when you're talking about Natasha, I remember listening to her before the book came out and she shared a bit about it uh, and it was just powerful. So yeah. I, I completely yeah. agree with you. So I have a question here. I'm almost certain it's it's from a fellow poet. I don't know who, but I just, just uh, when, I, when I hear it, that's what it makes me think of, but I'll ask you. It says, Jericho, I am always struck by the quality of your voice as you read, honor and love your words, uh, and love your words. Could you talk about embodiment and the relationship between the poet's body and the poems? It's a great, that's a great question. You know, I really do believe uh, the poems work best if you can hear them off the page. When I fell in love with poetry, I was a kid. I mean, I was six, seven, eight years old in libraries, pulling poetry books off the shelf. And I was, I fell in love with poetry, quite frankly, because poems were short. I wasn't intimidated by the amount of text on the page. And I remember my early experience of reading uh, Gwendolyn Brooks and Langston Hughes and Sylvia Plath and, and Emily Dickinson and feeling as if I heard someone speaking the words in spite of the fact that I was the only person in the room and I wasn't moving my mouth, do you know? So that's what I'm trying, that's what I'm after. Um, I'm after something somatic and something aural when I write the poems. Uh, and I think, because, and I, I, I believe in that, you know, as a person, I think part of that has to do with the fact that I grew up in the black church and there are certain things that you hear in the church that you don't just hear without moving around or without grunting or without saying amen or without waving your hand. Um, and I, I want to make poems that are like that experience of pomp and circumstance that I remember the black church being, you know, that order of service, you know exactly what is going to happen. When you go to church, you know the order of service, you know what goes where but you don't know how it's going to happen every Sunday. And that's what I want. And I want, and the best way uh, for me to give that over in my poems is for me to have that in myself. So if I'm writing something I can bodily react to, then I know it's something that I can keep on the page. Wow, that's deep. Uh, here's a good question. Uh, where were you in your life when you found your purpose? Wow, that's a great question. Um, where was I in my life? when I found my purpose? It's an interesting question because I think, well, I'll, I think it's a great question, but I, I wanna say, and I, I, I sort of, I think this is the case for so many of us. Uh, we think about finding our purpose, but usually we're looking for our purpose when it actually we've already been avoiding our purpose all along. Like everybody, I mean, I'm sorry that this is true, but generally people know what they wanna, you know what you wanna do. <laughs> you know what you would really like to be doing right now. Do you know what I'm saying? So the question is, um, when, did I, when did I decide to take the leap? 
yeah. uh, which is not easy to take. The world sort of orders us. It tells us, uh, particularly the world we live in, you know, um, capitalism sort of tells us this is what you should be doing next. And if you're not doing that, then you're not a person of value. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I had to decide that I was going to be a person of value for myself and show up for myself. And I believe that happened in New Orleans when I was taking, um, I was taking workshops at the Nomo Literary Society. It's a uh, workshop, an African-American workshop that, that met in Treme, which is the oldest African-American neighborhood in the country uh, and led by Kalamu Yasalam. And I was around all these writers who were free in their writing. Um, and I remember Lynn Pitts was in that workshop. Keisha N. Brown was in that workshop. Terrence Hayes was in that workshop. Um, and I, I very, Marianne Moore, I very distinctly, um, I very distinctly remember thinking, well, if they can do it, I can do it. And so sometimes it's really about being around role models, being around examples, observing examples of how it's been done before, and then finding a way to cut your path in how it's been done before. So I was a really young person. I had just finished college. I always knew I wanted to be a poet, but I thought I needed to have a beard to do it. I had this idea, you know, people would, I would tell people I wanted to be a poet when I was growing up and they would say, well, what do you want to do for your real job? Or what do you want to do for your first job? I remember my aunt, I thought it was so sweet. She said, okay, well, what do you want to do for your first job? And I think um, I was under the impression that I needed to be older. Like I needed to be an old man to be a poet. I needed a white beard and I needed to be white. And so I was waiting for all of those things to happen before I took the leap. And then I decided, um, I decided at that moment that I was going to take the leap. And I want to say, let me say this. Um, I know we're, we're, we're crunched for time, but I do want to say it's not easy to take the leap. And I think it was a little bit easier for me because I'm queer. So I was already taking the leap in one area of my life where I knew I was going to be disenfranchised and rejected. And do you understand what I mean? And because of that, I, I, it was easy for me to decide, well, I might as well go all the way. I might as well literally do what I want to be doing. Yeah, wow, it's powerful. How, in, how important is music and tonality when you are composing and then finalizing your poems? Number one. Um, you know, it's so important. I mean, it's so important. I can't say how important it is. It's like, you know, how, how important is it that you breathe in order to live? <laughs> Nobody's thinking about their breath. As a matter of fact, as soon as you start thinking about your breathing, it gets hard to breathe. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I mean? So I, just, I think it's number one. I think in terms of line and I think in terms of the music each line of the poem can make. Wow. All right, here's our last question. Last question. Dr. Brown, what's your hype song? My hype song? Your hype song. They, the people uh, want to know. I like Mask Off by Future. That's an important song for me. I like um, Stevie Wonder's. Um, uh, I like all of Stevie Wonder. So now I'm trying to narrow my Stevie Wonder down. Um, Sign Seal Deliver is probably my Stevie Wonder hype song to be honest with you. There's a song I discovered later in life by Diana Ross called You Were The One, which I've been jamming to a lot lately. Um, I like a lot of trap music because it's all like, I mean, people have all these fears and worries and feelings about trap music, but it's all like inspirational street music, you know, <laughs> which is really interesting to me. Oh, it's always like, I gotta do what I gotta do. I got to do what I got to do. It's <laughs> just like inspirational messages. It's really interesting. Um, so, I, you know, um, it varies. I just, um, on my shuffle the other day, this old song by the B-52s called Rome came on. I got excited about that. I like that song. Well, as we uh, finish this out, you know, I didn't know if we, I didn't know if I could pull it off, but I had to find it. So, Jericho... I just want to thank you. I just want to just say this was an amazing experience. It was an honor to interview you today. And thank you so much for participating in the Decatur Book Festival. Uh, again, uh, just congratulations on winning the Pulitzer Prize. And uh, let me turn this down now. But uh, it, it was just a, a really fun, fun time today. And, and so thank you so much for for doing this with us. Thank you. Thank you, Matuan. You did a great job. I really appreciate the good questions and all of the all of the conversation.
Thank you. Y'all enjoy the festival. Thank y'all so much for being here. All right. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good afternoon, I guess. It's still afternoon. I'm thinking we're in a sports center. Thank you.